Welcome everybody to Hearers of the Word for the sixth Sunday of Eastertide. Last week we had the first verses of the I Am the Vine discourse, John 15, 1 to 8. And in the current gospel, we continue there from verses 9 to verse 17. The imagery of the vine is briefly dropped and there is a kind of clearer, more plain language. But towards the end, the image of fruit is taken up again. The sixth Sunday of Easter in Year B. Our presentation this time has a slightly different shape. We'll begin as usual with the current context and then read the full text. And I'm going to spend some time on the nature of farewell discourses in the Bible and the farewell discourse in John's Gospel. That will lead to a commentary. And then I'm going to use a marvellous quotation from Pedro Arupe, Nothing is more practical than finding God. And we shall close with a prayer. If somebody were to say to me, where would you find the best teaching on prayer, joy and the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? Immediately, three writers would come to mind. St. Paul in the Undisputed Letters, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts, and of course the Gospel of John. And it is not accidental that all three of these writers have this kind of trinity of prayer, joy, and the Holy Spirit. We pray in the power of the Holy Spirit who leads us to joy. The Gospel is the continuation of last week's Gospel, which ended in 15.8. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. In the more recent presentations, we've spent time on the Old Testament background to John's Gospel, the Jesus traditions as preserved in the Synoptic Gospels and reflected in John's Gospel, and we spend time reading across the Gospel. Now we still do some recovery of Old Testament themes, of course, but with this Gospel, I think it's more helpful to spend time on reading across the Gospel. And we begin with an attempt to understand the place and plan of the farewell discourse in John's Gospel. There is fairly substantial agreement that the fourth gospel can be divided into these four separate moments. There's a prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, and there's an epilogue, actually all of chapter 21. And then you have two so-called books, the Book of Signs and the Book of Glory. And the Book of Signs, effectively the ministry of Jesus, takes us from chapter 1, verse 19, to the end of chapter 12, that is verse 20, includes many famous scenes. The book of glory is really the 
final days of Jesus, beginning in chapter 13, 1, and ending with the last verse of chapter 20. And this section includes the washing of the disciples' feet, the farewell discourses, Jesus' prayer, the passion narrative, crucifixion scene, and resurrection appearances. Now our focus will be on the farewell discourses and Jesus' final prayer. There are different maps to help us to follow what happens in the last discourse in John's Gospel. But here's one that makes sense to me. This is reading it in five moments or five tableaux. The first is making God known, the foot washing and the giving of the morsel. That's John 13, 1 to 38. The second moment is departure. That's 14, 1 to 31, substantially duplicated in 16, 4 to 33. In the centre you have section 3, to abide, to love and the experience of being hated. That's 15, 1 to 16, 3. And that includes our gospel. Then the text goes back to departure in section 4, 16, 4 to 33. And finally you have the great final prayer of Jesus in chapter 17. So our text comes from moment three, to abide, to love, and the experience of hatred. Now our next step will be to ask, what kind of writing is this? There is considerable consensus that the final speeches in John's Gospel, effectively chapters 14 to 17, belong to a literary genre called the farewell speech or the farewell discourse. The farewell speech is well established as a literary genre in the Old Testament and the apocryphal books of the intertestamental period. There are numerous examples, like the blessing of Jacob to his children in Genesis 47, the farewell of Joshua to the nation of Israel in Joshua 22-24, David's farewell speech in 1 Chronicles 28-29. In the deuterocanonical books, we have the farewell speech of Tobit from his deathbed in Tobit 14, 3-1. Outside the Bible, the entire Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs are farewell speeches patterned after Jacob's in Genesis. And the Book of Jubilees gives farewell speeches to Noah, Abraham, Rebekah, Isaac. And Josephus includes in his history a farewell address for Moses. So this is a well-established literary genre. The context for a farewell speech or farewell discourse is the imminent departure, usually death, of the protagonist. And the great scholar Raymond Brown, in his classic commentary on the Gospel of John, noted 13 features of farewell speeches which are replicated in John's Gospel. For instance, the speaker speaks of imminent departure. There's a note of sorrow and reassurance. There is a recollection of earlier words and deeds. The instruction is to keep my commandments. Very often, the instruction is to love one another. There is an insistence on unity. The speaker looks somewhat to the future. The speaker may anticipate persecution. The speaker promises peace and joy. The speaker reassures them that God will be close to them if they remain faithful. The person speaking also mentions the endurance of his own name. And the last two moments the person departing will speak of what will happen after, so a successor. In the case of John's Gospel, it's the paraclete. And often a farewell discourse includes prayer for the children or for the people being left behind. And I put on the, on the sheet there all the references in John's Gospel which pick up these features of farewell speeches. So it's very well established, as you can see.
So we'll take the text in small paragraphs. So verses 9 to 11. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So begin the commentary by noticing three of the marks of the farewell discourse which are picked up here. The command to love, the instruction to keep the commandments and the note of joy. The little word as or just as is extraordinarily important in John's Gospel. When it says there, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, what it means is that the love that the Father has for the Son passes through the Son, so to speak, towards the disciples. It's strict continuation, not simply one modelled on the other. And the command to the verb to love occurs in John's Gospel very frequently, as you might expect. And I've put there in red all the occurrences in the farewell discourses. We saw before the important word to abide or to remain or to dwell, which also occurs here. It means faithfulness, long-term faithfulness. The word to complete or to be filled is also important in John's Gospel. And the note of joy here is that your joy may be filled or fulfilled or completed. And I put there finally, the keeping of the commandments is found very regularly in John's Gospel, as you might expect. The next two verses read, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And to note again, here we have two features of the farewell discourse type, the commandments and the instruction to love. In this particular section, the command to love is repeated in verses 12 and verse uh, 17. And they function as a sort of frame. Again, we have that deceptively simple word, as. That you love one another as I have loved you. In other words, the love between disciples is not simply modelled on Jesus' love, but Jesus' love is made real through the love of the disciples have for each other. The expression to lay down one's life is special to this gospel. It's found in chapters 10, 13 and here in 15. Um, it's found only in John's Gospel and in the letters of John in the New Testament. It means that Jesus' costly love is to be the standard for the disciples' own practice of love. And finally we notice that in John's Gospel there really is only one commandment and no detailed moral instruction unlike say Matthew or Paul. We continue. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. And here we have three marks of the farewell discourse type. God will be close and that's number 10. The commandments are to be kept, number four, and earlier words are recalled, that's number three. And in these two verses, there is a major change of status of the disciples indicated. In early Christianity, disciples refer to themselves as slaves or servants. For example, Paul does it regularly. Now the word friend occurs in this gospel on the lips of John the Baptist in 329 for Lazarus in 1111 and then in the farewell discourse here in these in these parts of John the gospel. He comes up again later uh, 
in the attack on Pilate, if he lets Jesus go, he'll be no friend of Caesar. In the Old Testament, only Abraham and by implication Moses are called friends of God. But in John's Gospel, this status is extended to all who follow Jesus. And finally, in verse 15, Jesus, the Word, has passed on all that he had heard from his Father. So we come to the remaining two verses. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that your Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. And this time there are four notes of the farewell discourse brought to bear, the recollection of earlier deeds, that's number three, the looking to the future, number seven, and the bearing fruit, the instruction to keep the commandments, number four, and of course the insistence on love, which is number five again. In this passage here, we are reminded of the call stories at the start of the gospel when Jesus chose the disciples. And in verse 16, we have the closing evocation of the vine image to bear fruit, fruit that will last. And again, prayer of petition is underlined. So that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. But of course, when you're immersed in love, what you'll be asking for will only be in accordance with whatever love would be. So in fact, even though it sounds like a carte blanche, it's, it's closely tied to the practice of Christian love. St. Augustine caught it very well when he said, love and do what you will, because what you will want to do once you're in love will be circumscribed by the experience of love. And in verse 17, the main teaching is emphasized yet again. I'm giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Pedro Arupe was a very famous father general of the Jesuits. And this meditation is one of his best pieces of writing, very commonly reprinted, but it's worth hearing it again because it echoes really John's Gospel. Nothing is more practical than finding God, that is, than falling in love in a quite absolute final way. What you are in love with what seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, who you know, what breaks your heart and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. And so we pray. God of all nations, in the gift of your Son you have embraced the world with a love that takes away our sin and bestows perfect joy. Grant to all who have been reborn in baptism fidelity in serving you and generosity in loving one another. Grant this through Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody.